Welcome to Medicare for All Explain. This podcast will enlighten our listeners and dispel the distortions that surround Medicare for All. Medicare for All Explained is produced in collaboration with Physicians for a National Health Program and is hosted and produced by Joe Sparks. I'm your host, Joe Sparks. This is Episode 63, Entrepreneurs and Medicare for All. My guest, Professor Jerome Katz, is an internationally recognized expert on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education. He currently is the director of St. Louis University's highly ranked entrepreneurship program. From a background in his family and his own business in Memphis, Professor Katz went on to obtain degrees from Rhodes College, the University of Memphis, and Harvard culminating in a Ph.D. from Michigan. He has been quoted in more than 200 articles in the major magazines in business and entrepreneurship, as well as the major American newspapers, and has had a lifelong interest in developing people's potential. Professor Jerome Katz, welcome to Medicare for All Explained. Thank you, Joe. Glad to be here. When a person says they are considering starting a new business, I want to start a business, what are their major concerns? Most often, it's either making money or getting a particular thing done. Some businesses have a focus on both. What that leads to is what you're trying to do, uh, going to connect with uh, customers, which is how you make your money and get your ideas or products out there. And once you've got that going, can you sustain it and make a living from it? Well, that seems pretty basic. And of course, something necessary, at least for a good living, is good health. So is getting health insurance a concern for somebody starting a business? It depends. An awful lot of people do businesses as side gigs, and very often they have their health insurance through a full-time employer. That said, there are more than 20 million businesses in the U.S., and more than half of those are just one-person businesses. So the business and the person are literally the same thing. So if the person is concerned about health insurance, they'll be taking care of it themselves. Very often, they may be using ACA sorts of marketplaces or something similar. Is there a consensus among small business owners and solo business owners about a national health program? Or do opinions vary? We're talking about between uh, the 27 million businesses in the U.S. and another 30 million freelancers. Uh, that are counted sort of separately, there is no consensus among any 50 million Americans. Why would it be any different here? (laughs) Okay. Well, based on what you know about Medicare for All, do you think that having a national health program like Medicare for All would make starting a small business and sustaining a small business easier and Do you think that freelancers would find it as a benefit? Well, freelancers have the option, the basic ACA options now. So uh, to the extent that Medicare for All enhances those options, that probably will be attractive. That said, the question is, would Medicare for All cost more than uh, existing ACA and private options? And that's always like the the driving question, because for those people, the money for this is coming out of their pocket, either as premiums or as taxes. So that's always going to be a bit of an issue there. If health care is taken care of through a Medicare for All program, uh, in a sense, it takes it off the table or off the backs of the business owners, the employers, and 
in that sense, it may be a relief to a lot of them, particularly in small businesses. Trying to manage health insurance for employees is enormously difficult and very time-consuming and fairly costly. So if the whole thing is literally moved off into a national Medicare for All program, that's going to take some of the burden off of small businesses. Do you think businesses would be able to have wage increases if we have a Medicare for All program? I guess that goes back to whether it costs more or less for the business. Exactly right. Uh, I don't think you could make any speculation. If Medicare for All is paid by increased taxes on businesses, well, those taxes are competing with money that would be paid to employees. So I don't see any windfall ahead if uh, we do Medicare for All. But on the other hand, the taxes might increase, but there would be no premiums for health insurance. And so the businesses, even though they're paying more in taxes, they could end up paying overall less when you include health insurance. And there are some studies that indicate that might be the case. That is true. But you're thinking as if everyone has uh, medical insurance these days. Even with the Affordable Care Act, uh, health care insurance is only mandated uh, or required for companies with 50 or more employees. And actually, 50 to, uh, I think it's 100 or 500, I can't, I can't recall which. If you decline to have uh, uh, insurance, you pay a penalty to the IRS. But some companies have argued that the penalty is uh, financially less onerous than paying for the insurance. When we start looking at the percentage of employees who have uh, access to medical insurance right now, in small, very small businesses, those numbers are actually pretty low. The Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, reported uh, in 2020 that medical care was only available to 27% of workers uh, in the lowest wage category. So three quarters of the people getting the lowest wages, so probably sub $15 very often, if we're here in Missouri, it's uh, seven and a quarter dollars an hour. So a lot of those folks, uh, well, 73% of folks in that kind of situation have no insurance. Not theirs, and nothing from their bosses. So anything that they get would be great. I'm sure they'd be happy to have it. But uh, financially, you know, it, either the employer has to pay something or they have to start paying something. Medicare for all, depending on how it's funded, would would be a godsend for folks in that kind of situation. But right now, uh, there are a lot of people who don't have insurance, even though they're working for small businesses. That's a great point. And I would argue, certainly, as many advocates do, that that's one reason why we need Medicare for all. I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm looking for a job, and I can get basically the same pay from a large employer or a small employer, but the large employer has health insurance, that might make me more prone to want to work for the large employer. So my question is, would having some type of national health program where everybody's covered make it easier for small businesses to recruit talent? Yeah, and they're actually, uh, uh, oh, who did it? There's a, a study uh, done by eHealth, which is one of the uh, insurance platforms. And they were looking, and they did a survey and uh, looking at what small business owners said would be the reason to uh, to get health insurance. And the number one response that was 66% of uh, people 
from 2018, but close enough for jazz. 66% of the people said that the reason uh, to have health, to offer health insurance to employees is to hire and retain the best workers. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly a group of small business owners who would see that uh, as a factor. And when they're competing against big companies that have more expensive benefit packages, uh, it is, that's a challenge. The flip side is that small businesses traditionally have more flexibility and more, more acceptance of, of individual variation, variability. So, uh, for a lot of, uh, people, uh, a small business where you're dealing directly with the owner, uh, and you're negotiating for more time off for, uh, family responsibilities or because something comes up is easier and more personal in those kinds of settings. So what they lack in the accoutrements of a big business, they try and make up for by a, a more personal kind of setting. And I'm just curious, of course, before 2016, you barely heard about Medicare for All. And now it's part of the conversation perhaps a little less so now that Joe Biden is president. But have you noticed a change in attitude by small businesses toward a national health program? Not really. When I look at surveys of small business owners, it really doesn't come up as a uh, question being asked or as a topic that's being discussed uh, a great deal. So if it is, it's very much Again, with the millions of businesses, uh, I'm sure there are business owners who have an interest in it, but it isn't uh, making waves in the general small business press or uh, in the professional and trade associations for small business owners. Now, in our previous conversation, you mentioned the National Federation of Independent Businesses, and mm -hmm. I believe you said that. They were against it, but they took that out. They're just neutral on it now. They took a case all the way to the Supreme Court with NFIB versus Sebelius. And uh, the Supreme Court, they were challenging the legality of uh, the ACA. And that was the Supreme Court took that and uh, decided that against the NFIB, uh, that Literally, the NFIB's case confirmed that the ACA was uh, legal. Uh, so they actually stopped complaining about that. Their recommendation, they were offering a health care insurance package to small businesses as one of their uh, for-profit services. So they saw, uh, to some extent, they saw ACA as an infringement on their insurance business, but they also in their, their legal case for the Supreme Court, they were saying that it was uh, an unfair and they contended illegal removal of choice from Americans. Americans should be able to decide if they wanted health insurance or not. Business owners should be able to decide if they want to offer employees health insurance or not. And the ACA, with its mandate and then the penalties if you didn't do the insurance, they said, in the face of that. Supreme Court said, no, it's a legitimate a legitimate approach to a serious issue, and they concluded the ACA was legal. After that, the NFIB really decreased their opposition, but they still continued to recommend uh, programs like theirs as an alternative with greater flexibility than what's available through the healthcare marketplaces. So... It would be hard to tell what the NFIB stand is on Medicare for All. Yeah, I haven't seen anything from them, or I I track about about five or six of the different small business associations. And in preparation for this, I took a, a quick gander across to see if there's something I missed, but there hasn't been much there. So at this point those associations don't see it as much of an issue. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, yeah, I, I would say it's that they don't, they, they don't see that as one of their key issues. 
Do you think that most small business owners or these federations understand what Medicare for All is and what it does? No, but I would say that's also a pretty accurate reflection of America at large. Yes, I would agree with that. There was a study that came out, and they were asking questions about Medicare for All. And their conclusion was that less than 10% of the population really understood what it is. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done just so people understand it. Mm -hmm. I could totally believe that. Before we end, do you have anything that you would like to add? No, I think we covered everything uh, that I had thoughts about. So I thank you for the opportunity. Well, Professor Katz, thank you so much for being on Medicare for All Explained. Thanks again for having me on. You have been listening to Medicare for All Explained. Remember to tell your family, friends, and colleagues about this podcast. Information about Medicare for All Explained can be found at our website, MedicareForAllExplained.org. The music for this show is Super Bubbly by Jesse Spillane. The logo was created by Lily Sparks. Thank you for listening.